So welcome to the podcast, Jamie. It's awesome to have you on today. Thanks for your time. No worries, Rob. So kick us off by helping us understand a bit more about you in terms of your own involvement in sport, how that kind of developed across childhood, adolescence and, and into your kind of sporting career. What did that look like for you? Yeah, um, I guess probably I would describe myself as always quite an active kid, um, quite sporty, but definitely not one of those talented ones. Um, whether that means I was a bit of a, a late developer or not, but I don't think I really shone at any sport. Um, you know, enjoyed doing PE, would do you know badminton, running about, walking, uh, football, and and you know kind of everything under the sun. But never one really kind of kind of captured me. I think my journey into I guess finding organised sport, if you like, was um, you know primary school sports day, primary seven. Um, wanted to, um, a new kid had joined the school, was always kind of a little bit fast in primary school. Um, he came along, he was very well developed. Uh, it was almost the David and Goliath moment and I decided I really was really competitive and actually really wanted to beat him. So um, decided to do uh, join my local athletics club for um i think four weeks of training because we all know that that's you know the <laughs> ultimate um period of time and you can make super gains in that period of time um and and obviously uh didn't change the result but um it did get me kind of hooked in in athletics um i kind of did everything in, in athletics you know i think i probably just a bit like a nomad wandered from event to event trying to find something i enjoyed it all but you know, nothing really kind of shone that. And, and I think, you know, particularly I was from the Highlands. So, you know, the talent pool is really small there and it even didn't shine in a really small ta talent pool. You know, did cross country, uh, long jump, high jump, sprinting, uh, middle distance, everything. And then it wasn't until probably I was about 15, um, 16, that actually that's when I discovered the 400 meters or the 400 meters discovered me. Uh, and actually a coach, one of the club coaches said, actually, you're pretty good at that. That, that was a good race. Um, and I started actually just focusing on, on that. And probably it really did suit me because I wasn't the fastest. Yeah, I wasn't the best sprinter. I wasn't the best at endurance or cross country, but I was pretty good at both or, or average at both. And actually that's, you know, the two, two, two. Uh, so I guess 400 meters found me and, and then I just, you know, increased a little bit of training, found something that I was really passionate about, had a great coach that, you know, like, you know, sort of, I started working with a little bit more, increased sort of training days and then sort of at 16, um, using sort of third, fourth year, got my, my first Scottish schools um, cap, so won a medal at Scottish schools and then went to the international and, and really it just kind of actually made me realise actually I'm actually not bad at this and I really focused a lot of efforts you know I, I started probably specializing you know I you know didn't go to a, a sort of a, a school trip uh, that was planned because I actually wanted to go to the schools international and, and sort of really focus my efforts at going down to bigger competitions even though I got absolutely gubbed um, at them and and sort of really exposing myself to I guess that I guess one for a better phrase is I didn't want to be a big fish in a, in a small pond and actually really threw myself into this, you know, sort of down at the, the British Championships and, and, and everything. Um, and so, that you know, for my, my focus there was like just really about actually improving my times and, and everything. Went to university um got with a, a, a new coach because I'd moved down to Edinburgh and, and sort of really like just sort of catapulted from there is that, you know, sort of really sort of, after a year of adapting to that program, progressed well, got a first GB cap and, and sort of my journey with, with Piot, my coach, um, was there. Um, he had a really different approach from, I guess, other coaches and certainly I knew of Scotland. Um, sort of, he was an, a Polish Olympian um, and world and European medalist in, in the 400 and 4x4. He from his background it was very like sports science orientated so actually I started to learn about the sport and I probably you know reflecting now that I am you know just a coach um not just a coach but I you know I am uh, just coaching and not actively competing um that was probably equally an 
fit for me in, in terms of my coaching. Do you know, I learned so much. Um, there was a period of time where he moved abroad and I was remote coached. Um, so everyone talks about Zoom and, and things like that. Now, back in 2010, 11, we were, you know, trying to work with Skype and, and YouTube and iPod, I am iPads to film sessions and upload them and 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 everything now and um, well before WhatsApp existed and stuff like that. So I look at you know remote coaching over COVID times and I think, gosh, this is super easy compared to <laughs> it was uh, you know sort of ten years ago. So yeah, and um, you know I'd been doing some coaching qualifications um, all the way through that journey. Um, my sort of part time job as as I was sort of starting to to come out of my athletics career, um, was sort of athletics development and you know sort of was starting to coach a little bit there. Um, everything from little tots and and run jump throw to then sort of taking a performance development group, um, there and and yeah, that was I guess kind of like a bit of a seamless transition I guess from competing as an athlete. You know, went to to Europeans you know, won medals at world championships and uh went to Commonwealth Games and home home games and, and then sort of seamlessly transitioned into into uh into coaching and um now work professionally in this in sport as um performance manager for, for gymnastics. Yeah, I mean not too bad for someone who described themselves as not very talented to get into the the world level and the Commonwealth level. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I do firmly believe I, I wasn't the most talented thing, and I think you know that probably reflects a little bit of my coaching philosophy is that actually, what do we when we talk about talented? Quite often at that age group, we actually talk about those that are physically more matured or their energy systems have they've either hit puberty and actually so the people that shine out to us, you know, from in terms of results or anything else tends to be those that are, you know, sort of physically well developed. And actually, we all know that, you know, we catch up in the end. And, and so actually, my own coaching philosophy, I, I tend not to look at, you know, how physically developed they are, or their results, but actually their training behaviors or attitudes and, and, and their mindset, really, you know, to me, you know, maybe it's, I'm slightly biased, but I was just a real grafter. Do you know, I, I, I really was passionate about sport. I wanted to improve. I wanted to learn. I wanted to listen from coach and, and try and put that into practice. And albeit I probably didn't quite have the coordination. It was always took me three or four efforts um, compared to some of my training partners. Even when I was, you know, in my 20s, uh, my training partners would pick things up a lot quicker than, than me. But I just kind of really just became a student of the sport so you know that probably really has influenced my coaching philosophy of actually it's it's really about that training behaviors that mindset that that mindset of actually if someone's going to make it or not it's not perhaps the physical gifts they were given but it's actually that determination and commitment and drive mm -hmm. and what so what does that look like i mean it's 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 easy sometimes for coaches to kind of we use kind of broad characteristics, but to you, like in that training environment, what, what shows us determination, what shows us drive, what shows us that commitment? What are, what are the little things that you kind of notice as a coach in your athlete? I mean, it is, you know, probably certainly the, the, the age group or the group that I'm, I'm working with sort of performance development it is a lot more than just turning up, Do you know, like commitment is above and beyond that. Um, I think it's, um, to some people, commitment is sacrifice you know, sort of actually not going to some social events and, and something like that, but actually taking the sport takes priority. That's not to say you don't have a balance, but, you know, actually they really want to do well. So they'll, you know, they'll, they'll go to bed early or they'll make sure that actually their, their sleep and their nutrition is, is really on point and want to learn more about that. And you just get a, I guess, a feel for, for an athlete um, that really just wants to try and be better so they're like they're, they're trying to they're like a sponge in, in the sense or they're trying to draw information from you they want to like learn more so when you say actually you know I, I certainly think with my approach to coaching it's you know I often use the word why and, and throw that question back to them and you can see the ones that then start to try and understand and then you know start to put the pieces in the puzzle them, themselves for themselves and actually take ownership of it so that you know, quite often if I'm at a session, you know, I can say, right, we're going to do a warm up and they'll get on with it and they'll do it and they'll do it to, you know, in a really focused way. And, and it's not just a case of just, you know, sort of rolling about and, and just, yeah, I'm ready for training. Actually, they'll put that 
effort into it and it'll be really really well done. you know like I think you know sometimes people treat warm-ups as just sort of like you know just shake about and, and stuff like that but actually it's it's more than just a primer you know for your training session quite often it's way it's about actually just overall conditioning and, and, and everything else so when I see that start to happen and then you know as well some of the individuals in the group start to take a little bit of leadership and and actually you know someone's new coming into the group showing them the ropes and and stuff like that and I get really passionate about like actually the athletes leading the sessions and in some ways that actually as a coach I tend not to say very much you know I'm, I'm there as to help them reflect or you know if they're maybe not quite there yet you still ask the question and then you help them fill in the blanks themselves. Mm. I, I really agree with that um, perspective because I think now, you know, looking back at the athletes that we coached at Pace and Metamill and the ones who have gone on to, you know, sign professional contracts, appear for, you know, professional teams. And it, uh, it was those guys who had that level of commitment over and above and that discipline and attention to detail, whereas perhaps the ones who were physically gifted had maybe fallen away. And, I, and that is an experience that I see more and more. And But it's kind of... It's funny because the accolades initially will go to the person who's who is getting the physical result, won't they? And everyone will talk about this kid being the up and coming thing. Meanwhile, in the background, there's someone who is kind of slaving away in the, in in the dark, but but you know has that commitment to kind of sit through. So it is interesting to juxtapose those two kind of, I guess, stereotypes, if you like. Yeah, and it's it's almost like how do you you know within selection policies and or you know whether that's for events or whether that's for for squads or programs it's how do you reflect that how do you how do you capture that and how do you quantify that and and it can actually you know when you do try and do it it can become quite hard difficult conversations either as a club or a coach to say oh, oh but this person's like the best as in like well yeah but they're the best right now because you know they're physically well more developed and and then it suddenly becomes a bit of an unfair one, you know, but, you know, and then do you take away by sort of, I guess, you know, of a, you know, sort of automatic and someone that shows the right talent behavior ever, but actually the sort of the more difficult journey to really sort of advance and come in that actually they get told no, so they go away and they work harder. So actually by putting them into the program a little bit earlier, are you taking away, you know, challenge would make them even even better. but you know if they behaviors and you know like who did it, they're just going to actually excel and, and, and thrive in, in that but it's it's a real challenge I think is that you know people sort of look at the comrades or the you know the sort of this is the best person and, and it's maybe a little bit easier in you know in, in team sports where actually you know it's you're not sort of necessarily looking at the the, the quantitative measure actually you can probably weave that in you know around you know leadership is so important in team sports that actually you could probably capture that much better than you know some individual sports whether that's athletics or, or gymnastics and that it's the score or it's the the performance that that catches someone's someone's eye not the the bits that go behind it mm, it's a really interesting perspective because i think it's it's funny we often give like psychology a lot of credit in these situations but it's often the last thing we measure or the last thing that people get support on you know they'll get support on technical coaching snc maybe a bit of nutrition input but very rarely will there be some structured psychological support in place unless there's an issue um and yet when it comes down to it we're like oh that person's really you know they're really committed they're really determined and it's like well those are psychological things we're talking about they're not physical things we're talking about but you're right it is difficult in that selection thing if you have qualifying totals or you have qualifying times to say oh i want this individual to to be selected but they're nowhere near the qualifying times well i, I see something in them it's like well you know what do you see how do we measure that it's a, it's a bit more uh yeah it's a bit more subjective isn't it yeah and it's you know you know we always try in sport to make things fair and objective but i think when we're talking about talent development you know before we get to that performance level whether that's you know at national level or you know beyond international level or british level you know it's those bits before that actually it's nothing's clear no one's path is set do you know like um, in the same way that someone that is physically well developed already and has those building blocks well established, if they've got those training behaviors and everything else on top of that, then wow, they could be like an absolute superstar if you know if they pursue that and and really build on that. Um, 
but in the same way that you know th those ones that you do see that perhaps you know were really gifted talented but really just were well developed and and then suddenly you're like well they didn't make it because people started to catch up and they weren't winning and and actually they kind of then weren't so enthused or passionate about it and kind of just fell by the wayside or you know they were always the ones that maybe sort of when you asked for six reps they kind of then would do four and a half or or sort of something like that and you would always see like the other person that you know maybe didn't have those physical characteristics just yet sort of always you know finishing six with beautiful technique and, and really focusing and you know where maybe lifting is heavy or, or whatever but just you know working away I think you know I, Probably I'm a bit biased in terms of because that was my own my own journey, but I, I do you know as more and more I've been coaching, I do kind of see that from you know working with that age group as those that you think wow they could really be good, and then you're like where were they <laughs> you know they just you know kind of disappeared off off the system because you know they just were de well developed and and suddenly actually someone that really was focused really wanted it determined kind of then moved kept at it and just, you know, really put in the, the hard work and the effort and where it was needed. Yeah, it's really interesting. It reminds me of a study, I think, um, I think it came out of New Zealand, but it was actually in athletics. I think it was looking at world junior place, like places, and then where they placed at senior level. And it was almost like a, you know, you were better off coming third or fourth or fifth than coming first, because it kind of the trend was the rate of progression was that actually those people who were you know, the Neelys actually ended up being the people who placed at the senior level, which ultimately is, is on paper what counts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, I think, you know, obviously it's great to say you went to World Juniors or World Europeans and, you know, that everyone has different destinations and different different journeys in, in sport and that might be to that level and, and that. And I think, you know, I also have that probably within my coaching philosophy that actually the power of sport is so important that you know I probably have like that technical I guess coaching philosophy of um you know like physical preparation underpins everything before we start to move into the into the technical side and, and that probably comes from my uh, I guess my SNC background um and then sort of you know looking into the the technical side whether that's you know athletics as a coach or gymnastics as a as a as a manager but in terms of that just overall philosophy of of the power of sport is that actually sport has the power to develop young people you know in sport and through sport and you know like the, you think of regardless of the journey like actually the skills you develop you know the the teamwork the you know like actually commitment to something and you know seeing something through the development process the taking ownership the independence and understanding the consequences the setbacks you know those are all life skills that actually are really important for young people to learn in sport regardless of what level level whether that's club um or you know regional international and and, and beyond it's it's a really important experience i think for young people to to then take into their to their adult life definitely so you obviously mentioned you were kind of collecting coaching experience and qualifications while you were still a competitive athlete. Was there a point at which you, you made the definite decision, this is the direction I'm going in, or was it just much more fluid when retirement came for yourself that you were like, this is just a natural transition? Um, it was probably a little bit more fluid. You know, I think, uh, the older I get, I kind of um, think, well, maybe I should have, you know, sort of. Uh, carried on a lot longer or, 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 or whatever you know I did retire relatively young Um, you know most sort of 400 meter runners probably um sort of retire around their 30s I retired before I was 30 um, and I think I was just a bit tired from the sport I think um, I, I took a little bit of time out I think you know I was aiming for Olympic selection. You know, I'd been to Europeans, Worlds, Commonwealth Games, and I was really working hard to uh, to be selected for Rio in, in 2016. Uh, didn't get selected. You know, decided that that was that was it. And in some ways, I had decided that was it. But then I was like, well, I probably could. You know, I was working remotely as a um, my coach was working remotely with me. Um, most of my training group had, had gone on to different things and so I was actually just training by myself so that year going into 
2016 was quite intense. Um, I kind of put everything into it and then wasn't rewarded with my ultimate ultimate goal in, in, in some ways. Um, and then at that point I was like, well, do I then just start to pursue my professional career as in, you know, in sport or out of sport and a job opportunity came up that, uh, and I just grasped it and, um, and then kind of, I guess in some ways never, never looked back, um, and kind of made the decision, you know, that was kind of the clean, if you like, um, and then sort of got back involved a bit more in athletics sort of a year after that, when Maria uh, Lyle, who I now coach, uh, kind of approached me in, in 2017 to say actually she she was looking for some advice on who to who to work with. She was going to base herself back up in, in Scotland and I said, well, uh, I've retired. I'm uh, not coaching. Sort of, um, I, have, I have my coaching qualifications. I think it was level three at that at that point. And I was like, I'm happy to, if you want to discuss that. And, and here we are sort of... Um, 2021 waiting for for Tokyo Paralympics um and sort of I guess kind of came back into the fold with um with athletics kind of through that uh but yeah I, th I think probably I you know I just as a young person you know decided to do some coaching because you know with the club that you know when I was even based even before I was 18 I think my first coaching qualification I did was as young as you could do it in athletics which I think was 16 so you know helped out with a little group and did some summer camps and just quite enjoyed that and um you know sort of did that a little bit part-time during my my career and it sort of just added on the the qualifications as as I went along so it probably was seamless in in some ways and and a clean break in in, in other ways so how does an athlete in a very objective sport like athletics end up working in a very subjective sport like gymnastics? Yeah, I mean, that certainly is, um, I guess, to fire. I think um, it, was, it was really quite hard to get your, your head around. Um, I think, you know, sort of outside looking, looking into the sport of gymnastics, it's like, well, you know, you do this, but actually somebody is analysing it saying, no, you did this, you know, you've not got a measuring tape, you've not got a stopwatch, it's, uh, it was really hard, but actually the more and more I, I started to learn about the sport, certainly within that first year, there was a lot of similarities, um, do you know, I, I worked predominantly at the start with um, artistic gymnastics, so, you know, that's the, what you see on TV probably most of the time, um, like some Max Whitlock and, uh, and, and Brim Evan and, and those sorts of heroes that won um, and Dan that won medals in uh, in London 12 and, and also in Rio 2016. Um, but actually I realised that actually that artistic gymnastics is not actually too dissimilar from athletics or certainly from from really running. I kind of took it in the sense of that, you know, you, you work as individual units, but you've actually got that team component to it. So um, yes, they are individual sports. Um, you you know, in the sense of it's one person goes up, does their part, comes back down, whether that's a run, a lap of the track, or whether that's, you know, a, a routine on a piece of apparatus. And then, you know, and actually it's your, your team score. So it's, I think, you know, it, it isn't a true team sport, but there is that team sport. And I think I always, you know, talk about my colleagues that work exclusively in team sports that, you know, we, we're not individuals. We don't just work in silos by ourselves. We've got a training group. We've got that camaraderie. We've got, you know, that banter. We've got that, that team spirit in training. It's, but it's when it comes to actually performing and deliver, it's, it's one person and one person alone. So I probably drew similarities from that. Um, you know, I think as a sport, it, it probably gymnastics are related to, um, quite a bit because of, I guess sort of the discipline and you know the focus that's that's required um and you know when you you know in, in instances you're at an absolute awe of you know what what they can do and what they do do and you're like how is how is that physically possible how is that biomechanically possible and then you start to understand well actually they started off just here and and you know and, and, and that journey and building on to that and, and moving that that skills forward so um, you know, it, it is. Um, I think it's it's probably a much more comfortable with objective, subjective, and 
measures of the sport um, compared to what I was kind of before. I think, um, you know, there is a, an element to it that isn't necessarily objective. You know, that your score has two components in gymnastics. So you have your difficulty and that's, you know, that skill is worth this and that skill's that. That's probably the less objective part, but then you've got the execution part. And, you know, I have, uh, I did do a judging course to try and understand a little bit more, um, albeit to the very lowest level, but um, just to the, actually the execution side and the, the, the difficulty part that um, it, it is subjective, isn't that someone saying, yes, that was a, a small fault or that was a big fault, but then I guess there's that wider that's points that isn't really so if it's just kind of guess the the rules and you know there's probably some elements that come into track and field that are a bit subjective when you've got you know decisions whether did someone cross the line first or um you know did someone you know go out their lane on and actually did somebody kind of the bar on or did their their elbow drop and that throw was disallowed so um you know i think it's a a, a spectrum rather than a pure objective or or pure subjective um, scoring measure. So give us a bit of an understanding of what your, your role is like. So as a performance manager, what are kind of your roles, responsibilities, what are the groups you're working with, etc. Yeah, um, so I guess as a, as a Scottish governing body, you know, my, my remit's probably quite hard because, you know, we're working in a, a sort of, I guess, a slightly smaller uh, system. But um, currently my role is a sort of a look discipline. So... I look after all the disciplines that would feature in this, um, and um, most of them then feature in, in the Commonwealth Games. So there's a, um, a group of disciplines that are totally amazing to, to watch and, and see that you don't get to see on the uh, the Olympic stage, but you get to see on the world stage, the European stage. Um, but I focus on those disciplines, men's and women's artistic, so that I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, rhythmic gymnastics and then trampolining um, as well. Um, so I guess I'm kind of responsible for the whole pathway um, to kind of, I guess our aspiration is to try and uh, support and develop gymnasts and coaches to uh, British and world levels um, within those disciplines. Um, that sort of is a sort of a little milestone of Commonwealth Games. So sort of every four years we've got to prepare a team um, for a Commonwealth Games. I was team manager in uh, Gold Coast um, and been appointed as team manager for, for the Birmingham Games in, in 2022. Um, so I guess, you know, I, within that, a lot of it is um, coach development as well as gymnast development. Um, you know, a system is only as good as, as a coach. And I think that was probably a real eye-opener for me coming in as an athlete is that actually... Yes, you know the athlete is centered and, and is really important, and that well-being around them is 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 really important. But I know from my own career, your career is limited. But actually, a coach could coach you know dozens and dozens and hundreds of of of, of gymnasts. So we've got to invest as much into the gymnast as we do into the to the coach, and um, and certainly probably you know lower down the path. I guess where we talk about actually nobody's journeys very sure because you know you're still growing and you know particularly with an, an early specialization sport it's actually can we support the coach more to make actually the um you know the right development plan that will see that 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 young person excel and um you know that's probably more true with a, a um i guess the way our sort of system is set up that you know we don't have a centralized system you know 90 percent of the work is done in clubs we have sort of national training, whether that's pathway training, development training, or or national training. Um, you know, anything between, you know, once a quarter to sort of every two months or when it certainly comes up close to the games, probably on a monthly basis. But, um, you know, it's the personal coach training environment. And that's something I can totally relate to, to myself. You know, I think I was an average athlete and my coach was a coach, but he made me or uh, together we made sort of some some really great world class performances, and so you know I think at the end of the day sport is as much a technical part, but it's also a people people sport. It's a people industry. It's a people business, if you like. 
So actually that relationship between the coach and the, the athlete, whatever sport that is, is actually really important because that's where synergy comes in, is that you can take a, an average coach and a, an amazing athlete and you can make a world-class performance. You can take a world-class coach and a world-class athlete and you can have an average performance and you know the inverse is true you can have a, a an average athlete and a world class coach and, and suddenly actually you get amazing performances so you know it's not just about the physical characteristics and it's not just about the mindset but it's actually what what what's that partnership look like and and actually where where that takes takes you and where it takes those performances is really important so i think we really we you know really try to acknowledge the system and it, and it certainly relates to my in philosophy it makes a lot of sense actually as another commonality perhaps between athletics and, and gymnastics is maybe the duration of coach athlete relationships like in team sports you know if you're with the under 16s one year and you get promoted to the under 17 yeah you know, 18s whatever it's not that normal that you would have a coach for maybe 10 years at that developmental level whereas perhaps in gymnastics and athletics it's a bit more common would you say yeah definitely i think um within gymnastics probably there's um probably I've seen more I guess that sort of like taking them from a really young age to like from maybe sort of first thing in club or certainly the first sort of few years in the club and then taking them all the way through to to senior um probably in athletics it's it's just a little bit the same but probably not the same sort of like first entry point to to, to senior it's probably a little bit more common in in gymnastics and that perhaps it's from just the sport or certainly artistic gymnastics being a little bit more professionalized and so the coaches are sort of full-time coaches and sort of probably are able to get involved at every stage of the of the development and an age group whereas you know most of the athletics coaches are volunteers so actually they're probably maybe coaching you know times a week or maybe just on on, on one group or one group um perhaps Mm. So give us a bit of a, you know, pre-COVID or outside of COVID, a bit of an overview of the a day in the life of a performance manager at Scottish Gymnastics. What does it look like for you? Yeah, um, for me, um, it uh, certainly pre-COVID was, I probably would describe myself as a uh, very busy, bit manic perhaps, but um, a sort of manic schedule. Um, I guess I was sort of unbalanced my, my full-time job with um, with um class athlete um is is a bit challenging so um my sundays and my weekends tend to be dedicated to planning of programs for for the week ahead and and just reviewing where where things are at um i spend probably quite a lot of time on camp i think that's really important within my role just you know i'm not a technical person but you know i help shape and hit shape the program and and help make selections and, and involved in lots of different parts it's really important for me to be visible and also out with given that i'm out with the sport it's really important that i'm in that training environment to try and understand more about the sport you know every day is learning like before i couldn't even spell didn't even know what a catch of a kovac was but now i can spell it <laughs> uh, lots of russian russian skill names um, and japanese names um so my spelling has improved <laughs> um but it's, you know I, i'm really dedicated to being about but just because it's you know about building that relationships with both the coaches and, and the gymnasts and and you know seeing and you know trying to understand actually how can we make things better um and um yeah so sort of i guess sort of monday to the friday or sometimes monday to thursday probably spend time in the office sort of i guess that's or helping organize different events or programs or catch-ups with coaches and and check-ins and and seeing how things are going to then probably sort of weekends or sometimes four-day camps sort of span across the weekends sort of going along to them sort of and because i look after four disciplines and um, each kind of have different programs in the pathway and most weekends um, or at least one weekend every month sort of away on, on camp or just popping in for a day or two to check in how things are are going um, probably in some disciplines um, um, I tend to get a little bit more hands-on uh, where I can um, you know where we have physical prep embedded um, we have our physical prep coach I probably um, jump in with some of those sessions and, and help out um a little bit um 
is at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a coach and I, I can't help myself. Um, and I uh, haven't, haven't got as far as um, starting to, to coach running in the vault run up, um, but it is, a, it is an important, um, I guess, component within, within vault, but not the, the most important. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, finding those boundaries of that you're not a technical person, but actually just trying to understand a little bit more. And then, you know, sort of most evenings, um, then sort of coaching, whether that's in the gym with with um, Maria and the rest of the group or down at the track, um, doing some sessions and then weekends sort of here, there and everywhere. So that was um, busy before, um, before COVID, didn't really spend much time in the house. Um, and then, you know, sort of COVID came and spending probably as much time um, coaching but just over a different platform um, probably actually as well with the day job is probably doing more actively coaching in some ways sort of I guess um, setting up lots of different zooms to support gymnasts and coaches and training at home is you know a, a really bizarre environment for them they've not got the apparatus or the space that they're used to but it's actually then becomes a game of how do we support them to keep the physical characteristics or the physical qualities that are really important to gymnastics and replicate that at home. Um, and so that was a really important journey and we have a fantastic SNC coach, uh, Paul Coyle, and sort of been working closely with him and, you know, quite often kind of co-delivering on, on Zoom or, or sort of supporting that. Um, that's sort of Zoom delivery. And then at the same time, uh, trying to do some stuff with my guys. Brilliant. So how do you, how do you find the, uh, the side of things in terms of obviously, you know, we've mentioned a bit around maturation, a bit around physical development, but one of the other kind of, I guess, key characteristics of gymnastics is, as you've already mentioned, being that early specialization sport, as opposed to, you know, athletics, where it would be a later specialization sport. How have you found that dynamic and, and navigating that? Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting. I think, you know, even when you consider, I guess, you know, you become a senior, uh, a bit of so my, my background, uh, university wise is, is French. Uh, so in, um, uh, in France <clears throat> for like the under 23 age group, um, they call that S wars, which is like hopefuls, um, you know, as sort of, that's the transition point between, um, you know, between senior and, uh, you know, becoming a junior and a senior is that sort of, I guess, really key age group in athletics. That same term is applied to like kind of one of the first age groups in, in gymnastics. So it's almost, it's really interesting from a linguistic side of like, it's just that slightly different approach that SWARS is actually the first age group, you know, SWAR, junior, then senior. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it was quite interesting. You know, I've, I think, you know, within athletics, I've worked across the pathway, you know, from little kids that run through. So, um, you know, it's, I've always, you know, probably managed to work and interact quite well with, with that age group. Um, you know, it is a young specialization sport, but actually you're starting to see that, you know, like most of our, our, our Commonwealth team um, in Gold Coast, you know, most of them were over 18. Um, you know, so we're really, I guess, in the more truer sense of the word, the senior um, gymnasts. Um, and certainly a world championship level, the way the sport is going, because of the difficulty in routines and therefore the complexity in the in the skills that require so much more strength that we'd actually this that's the way the sport is going is that yes it is a, a young early specialization but actually because of the I guess the difficulty element that you need to be fully developed you need to have you know gone through puberty and, and out the other side in order to have that strength and, and that power to do some of those those skills so I think it is changing I think you know I've only come in at a small small period of time and but certainly I guess it was different from I guess from my expectations because you kind of always hear gymnastics being as a, an early specialization sport and and sort of you know really young but I guess the days of having a, a 14 year old Olympic champion has, has totally changed. And I think that started to change the big change in, I guess, the, the structure of the sport. So he, um, which was around Beijing Olympics, um, 
time and you know that, that that's starting to see I guess some some changes um within that but you know it, it's, it's really I guess just interesting to see I guess you know young kids that are really dedicated to the sport and some of the, the training hours they they do I think that can be if you're not used to the sport it can be quite um quite uh can kind of leave you quite a gas you're like wow oh gosh they, they do all that and and that's becomes really important around sort of that balance between you know sport and and, and life you know I, I probably with the athletes that I work in in track and field that comes in when they're sort of like six year fourth year when they're doing exams that you start to talk about life balance but actually it's a really important message to have do you know what, even at primary school level, believe it or not, um, within the sport of gymnastics, that actually your education, your academics, and your social side is really important for your your develop uh, your development. Um, and so it's a really important message, I think, is striking that that balance, and you know, not getting too, I guess, carried away with the sport and forgetting actually, you, it's a young person um, at heart that still has to has to develop both in other aspects of their life, not just in in sport. So what's next on the horizon for you in the next sort of 12 to 18 months? Obviously, you've already mentioned Tokyo. What, what other big things are happening? Yeah, um, so I um, I guess our restart of competition on, on track and field, um, I've got uh, been selected as one of the team coaches for the uh, European Para Championships for, for GB. So um, that kicks off in, in June, all, all, going, all going well. Um, so that will be, I guess, for me, will be an interesting uh, change is that, you know, previously I've just been along at championships as a personal coach. I've got one person to, to support and um, and so it'll be interesting, I guess, sort of working with some other athletes and supporting them sort of pre-championships that maybe don't have their personal coaches there um, and getting to know them in a really short period of time and supporting them as best as you can, I think. Uh, everyone has different rituals, routines, and uh, preferences, shall we say, sort of pre-championship. Um, so it's you know I'm having been there myself. I'm I'm really um, acutely aware of that, and so actually uh, you know I want to do the best job I can in supporting them. The moments before they go into call room that actually can be so critical um, to having a good performance. Um, um, and then Tokyo is is on the on the horizon uh, later on in in the year as well, and then sort of switching to the gymnastics side, um, we've got a big a big job of um, you know of probably over the last twelve months, um, I've learned more about return to training, albeit my background in in S and C and um, than I, I ever have uh, picked up a lot of great chats with some physios and and stuff like that. I've been quite really heavily involved in the return to training guidelines, protocols, suggestions for, for gymnastics um, last time. I think, you know, with the sport of gymnastics, the landing forces that, you know, you that you put your body through is phenomenal, you know, sort of, I guess the average is probably 10, 12, 15 times your body weight. And depending on what skills that can be, you know, up to 20 times your body weight. So having not done that and all the landing forces and the plyometric elements, um, you know, we spent a lot of time sort of helping coaches understand what that 12 weeks of return to training looks like. And, you know, away from apparatus as well um, and starting to help people define the difference between generic fitness or general strength and sports specific strengths. It was really interesting. Probably I would always, before COVID, always talk about it's really important to have not just the sport specific strength but really important to have the underpinning general strength and now i'm kind of like talking about the other way around i'm saying yes you've been working from home it's really great and you've got that general strength and that general fitness but you've got to bridge it into the sport specific fitness again so it's um it's quite funny that i'm kind of a different different message for different times um so you know you know when restrictions start to ease it's probably talking about that again and, and you know we have a number of gymnasts that are preparing for Birmingham um 2022 I think um you know a month out of the gym probably equates to a month rebuild and then a month before you can start to compete and you know sort of when we're back in 2020 
Birmingham seemed not too far away. And now, you know, it's a year to go and, and, you know, there's still some restrictions in place and competition isn't about, you know, these are people that haven't, uh, gymnasts that haven't competed actually for 18 months, maybe two years by the time they get their first competition. So um, it'll be about supporting them in, in, in that and in that return to competition and making sure they have some really great preparation in lead up to guess the qualification window opening and then you know as the qualification window happens people get nominated selected and then supporting the team in, uh, to Birmingham um, as we when we when we get to August uh, July August 2022 so not a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah loads of free time yeah that, that bit around the return to training is a really interesting area because I think it's it's going to be an interesting you know six eight weeks where people are, you know, both athletes and coaches are raring to go, but need to have the restraint to hold back. Otherwise, there is the danger of running to all these overuse injuries or acute injuries, because, as you say, although we've been doing gene generic things or general strength and conditioning, you know, regardless of the sport, every sport has its own unique demands. And, and actually, you can't necessarily replicate that at home with body weight or even with a barbell and plates or whatever, you know, that we still need to respect the sport and say, actually, we're going to need a time to accumulate, you know, sport specific training, but also get your body ready to, to go again. Yeah, it, it's so hard. And, and, you know, having gone through it back in the uh, sort of September time with, with gymnastics and, you know, sort of those messages and, and, you know, it's it's almost like coaches are having to be the bad cop and sort of like, you know, kids are just, you know, young people, especially, it's probably harder with the young people that, you know, are, are sort of just so raring to get back to the sport that they love and, and just, you know, why do you do your sport? Because it gives you a thrill, you're passionate about it. And then someone says, well, actually, we need to go really slowly back in and they've been just been dying to do it for the best part of four, five, six months. So, um, you know, I think a lot of, I think a lot of coaches, um, certainly within our sport um, and in Scotland, you know, really paid attention to that and had like a really nice smooth transition. And I think we're really aware to that. And then that experience will then lend itself to when we're able to restart again, sort of um, hopefully at the tail end of, of next month into, into May. So, um, you know, it's just how do you make it fun when you can't do to the sport that or the parts that you you know really give you a, a buzz and and you know throwing yourself in the air and doing flips well actually can't do that just quite yet um but it's also then you know it's, it's actually been quite a great opportunity for what we started calling brilliant basics um that actually you know it's really important all the way through your career to do the basics well if you look at the, the top level gymnasts and, and and it also applies to other sports well but you know they do the basics really well the basics then lead to these really more complicated skills and actually if you can't do a handstand in gymnastics perfectly you're always going to face lots of deductions or you know your score is always not going to be as good as, good as it can be and it might mean that actually you know really complex skills that require different movement patterns if you've not got those shapes that strength or that kinesthetics to understand that then you're perhaps not going to manage to, to to progress also i think it's really an important message of it's really important to focus on basics do your basics brilliantly do them well and actually that'll lead to, to better skills later on so it has provided us that opportunity i guess over this last 12 months probably to, to kind of talk more about brilliant basics the important of it and not just rush to the to the big shiny skills um you know, I guess to use a, a track and field uh, adage, it's um, you gotta you gotta learn to walk before you can run. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Jamie. Where can people, you know, find you on social media or, or on, you know on the internet if they're interested in keeping up to date with with what you're doing? Yeah, um, I'm probably most active on. Uh, um, Twitter and, and Instagram. Um, Instagram's probably more about my uh, more about my dogs than uh, about my uh, my 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 day job, my sport, or working in sport. Um, but I do quite often. That I have two. I guess one that sort of over this last twelve months have got a sort of um, a Coach Dot Bowie um, Instagram where I, I kind of post a couple of different exercises of stuff to do at home. 
uh, not very regular, but as best as I can. Uh, and also then my probably more interesting one, especially if you're a fan of dogs, um, is uh, JKB400 uh, Instagram and then Twitter. I'm, I'm always, I guess, retweeting or talking about different stuff sometimes on Bowie to Bowie um, on Twitter. So yeah, I'm, I'm not the most interesting person to follow nowadays. Probably when I was an athlete and going there, uh, you know, tweeting about training or uh, far flung places I was heading to, but now I'm just probably too busy to <laughs> head down and too busy to pick up the social media. Brilliant. Well, thanks again for your time. It's really cool to, to chat about your own journey in sport and, and the coaching that you're doing and transitions and some great topics in there that I know people will take a lot of value from. So thanks for your time today. It's been really good.